still got some I've still got some um, free downloads on that website. So if you need warm ups for your young ones, or uh, you know, there's a blog on there that talks about my pedagogical philosophy a little more too. So you can go on there and uh, agree, disagree, ask questions. I'd love to just be a resource for y'all. One quick little disclaimer before we get started. I'm limiting the scope of this to public school age, like fifth to 12th grade. Since I'm assuming that's kind of what we're thinking, the, what the scope of this class is to begin with. But there's some things that like, as you get further down in your development that are like only half truths. Um, so just know what, what the information I'm gonna give you today should set you up just fine for a beginner um, up until they graduate high school. Um, yeah, the, the intent is the same, but some of the instruction may be just a bit different. So let's hop right in. Uh, just kidding, before we do that, if I start, if you guys feel me going on a rant and it's something you guys have already covered, Pop the blue hand up and I'll be happy to move on. I don't want to cover anything that you guys already know because there's a lot. So let's talk about the instrument itself. Um, there's, again, some assembly required. One of the things that I find with newer educators and you know, trombone babies, as I love to call them, is they kind of struggle to put the instrument together in a way that's not awkward and doesn't risk them damaging the thing. So the way I like to teach this is, you know, they'll have their case on the floor, not a on a chair just on the floor. You'll grab first, ideally with your right hand, and then you'll pop that guy just straight down on the floor, let it rest on the you know kind of end crook of the the main sliding thing, which is of course called the slide, conveniently enough. With the left hand, you're gonna want to grab the bell. So that's the section with you know the bell flare and the tuning slide. You're gonna find the threaded part, as you can see right there, the slide. And it's as easy as just you pop it right down on there, tighten the screw. So there's a, when you get the bell on, you'll see that there's another hole. Seems like something should go in there. It's the mouthpiece, that's where that goes. You all probably already knew that. So what you wanna do is try to set up this angle right here at about 90 degrees. 90 degrees generally will fit in most hands pretty comfortably. I was a very small child. I'm still a fairly small man. So my angle is a little less than 90. Um, but you know, 90 usually will work for most people. Some people will go a little higher. There's no technically correct way to put that together as far as the angle is concerned, as long as it's comfortable for the hand. As brass players, we all know the less tension that we have, the better. And the same is true for something as simple as just how you hold the horn. So. Um, allow the student to experiment with the angle as long as it's not, you know, 180 where it's like a flat line. And as long as it's not, you know, so close that you can't move the slide without hitting the bell, it's all fine. Oh, the other weird thing is um, some people struggle to figure out how to hold the horn. So I, the easiest way for me to teach it is in your left hand, you want to make, you know, the shape of an L on your forehead or like a finger gun. You'll just slide that on through your thumb will go either on the trigger or on this kind of main brace if you're playing on a student horn the other three go right there right so finger gun put it right there and then just grab on and then of course your right hand you'll want to um, take you know, your index your middle finger and your thumb you got to do the italian thing and then that's how you're going to want to move the slide and then that's you know perfectly fine from bone posture. As far as I know, that's the um, you know, proper way that's taught you know, to hold the thing. So there are seven kind of basic trombone slide positions. Um, educator life hack: there is many different positions as there are notes, but these are kind of regions that we you know initially teach. This is where the positions are, and then as your students get further in their development. Each other position is just a variation of these seven. So as you can see here, first position is when the slides all the way in. Second is about, and this is one of those rules that changes, but is about halfway between the bell bead right here and all the way in. Third is when the hand slides brace right here that you actually hold on to. This guy is just a hair in front of the bell. I know on this graphic, it looks like it's even, that's not true, it's just a bit in front of it. Fourth position is, depending on the horn, but the way I like to teach it is the end of the outer slide 
should be about even with the bead of the bell. Fifth position is the hardest one to teach because it, there's no good landmark for it. So I like to do like a process of elimination type thing. I go to seventh all the way out. So there's, um, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see it with this camera and the lighting, but mm, it's not showing up. So this is an in-person discussion, unfortunately, but there's a certain point on the trombone slide. I'm trying to play with the light to find the angle where it's raised just a little bit and you can see it. If you can see where the end of the trombone slide gets a little thicker, that's seventh position. Anything out there is seventh. And then fifth and sixth, um, again, are the two hardest ones to teach. Sixth is when you pull it in just to the point where the stocking, which is that raised part I was mentioning, disappears. And then fifth is gonna be in between fourth and that. There's a, a long standing tr trombone joke, even in the professional community, that fifth position is just no man's land. Nobody knows where it is. And I mean, it's true, like, nobody visually knows where it is. That's one of those deals where you have to use your ear. And it's pretty darn important that you put students with a good ear on the trombone um, for reasons that we'll talk about later. But of course, you can kind of see it's a slide pitch approximator. Right. So with without a good ear, they're going to have a hard time really figuring out where these positions are because you can show them pictures and stuff all day and that'll help. But ultimately, um, they have to hear it. They have to hear it. And they will at that age. They're more intuitive than I think we give them credit for. If I need to go back so anybody can take notes or screenshot or whatever, let me know. Just again, pop the blue hand up or uh, throw it in the chat either way. So posture. Um, posture pretty much is, is the same for every wind instrument. There's not really that much difference. Um, you want your feet flat on the floor. You want your waist up to be the same as it would be if you were standing. So sit wherever on the chair that, you know, that allows your body to function in that way. Um, again, you want to be as devoid of tension as possible. Uh, tension kills sound and um, can undo a lot of great teaching as well. So just Keep an eye, make sure that your kids in an effort to um, you know, please the teacher aren't like trying real hard, puffing their chests out and arching their back to stand up as straight as they can. Make sure that you know the um, that, that kid, you know what I'm talking about, isn't like you know, just vibing. Like right? <laughs> you make sure that they're just, you know, upper half perfectly erect, feet flat on the floor, and then everything else should kind of just fall where it's supposed to. Uh, your movement when you play the trombone should come primarily from the wrist, primarily from the wrist. You want as little movement as possible in your body as a whole, again, to deflect tension. So the way I like to think about it is like um, your elbow is kind of like your camp, right? So your elbow will um, kind of stay stationary. Occasionally it'll move for long shifts of the slide. Um, but I like to think of the fingers and the wrist as your scout. So this will set up like kind of a base for your wrist and your arm, or sorry, your wrist and your fingers. And then your wrist and your fingers can explore within that kind of parameter that your elbow set. So all the motion, uh, as much of it as possible should come from the wrists and from the fingers. As you can see there, I've got a pretty, without moving my elbow, a pretty decent range just as is. And then if I needed to go out to seventh, I would extend the arm and then I need a bigger camera. Same kind of deal. So. Um, as, as you can see, it's pretty fluid. It's pretty relaxed and that's what you want. That's what you want. You don't want any kids, you know, doing the, you know, sawing logs kind of thing. The jerky slide motion will, you know, move the horn around on their face, uh, which is gonna mess with their sound. It can eventually mess with their range. Teaches bad mouthpiece and embouchure habits. Um, and then later on, when we start talking about legato and like smooth playing, uh, slurred playing, a jerky slide will undo all of that, all of it. So the two most common posture problems that I see with younger players are uh, a lot of times they'll want to like get their shoulder up, you know, you got to kind of get that. And it's typically the left shoulder. They'll want to support the horn for some reason with the shoulder. Get that out of their ear. You got to make sure the shoulders are down. Nice uh, downward slant if that's natural for them. Otherwise, just relax as possible. And then try to get your kids out of the habit if they get into it or like doing that thing, you know. Um, again, this is old news for you all as educators, I'm sure, but just make sure that there's 
uh, efficiency is the name of the game. As little movement as possible. As little movement as possible. Embouchure, I, um, now this is, this is one of those areas I'm not gonna claim to be an expert about. Um, I used to think a lot about embouchure and uh, got myself into a lot of trouble with it. So these days, I, my teaching has changed drastically because I wanna help my students you know, not have to go through that. So I teach, don't think about it. If the sound is good, cool, well, I'm gonna leave it there. Um, if you've got embouchure issues, maybe I can help. If I can't, I'm sending you to somebody, to an expert. This is something that I try my best not to think too much about. Um, paralysis by analysis is a real thing. So if you tend to overthink, um, don't dig in too hard on this. If it works, it works. That being said, uh, the concrete information I can give you on this is um, uh, drive, the, drive these concepts home with like um, at this age with physical reinforcement rather than conceptual. Um, but don't have them thinking about their face too much. You want to have them memorize like a shape and then let it be. So the main things to kind of look out for with embouchure, and again, this is probably old news, um, these little guys right here, see how he's got, I think those are called laugh lines, maybe. Um, that's a sign that you're engaging the right muscles when you do, do the thing. Um, you want to keep the, you know, the chin flat, as you can kind of see there. Corners back and firm. You don't want them smiling. You don't want them power frowning. Just, you know, put them where they're supposed to go. It should be pretty natural, but kind of glue them in place. Uh, but again, both in moderation. You know, you don't want everything too tight because the lip's job is to sit there and vibrate. But the more you clamp down here, the less you're allowing them to vibrate. And obviously, your sound and range will both suffer. So um, just enough to keep things from collapsing and no more. Keep it as natural as you can. Chase the sound. The sound should teach your face what to do. Um, again, don't stress embouchure too much. You know, if you see a kid who's not, you know, pulling them down as much as you'd like, or one whose chin maybe looks a little bunched up, um, keep in mind that everyone's anatomy is different. None of us were designed biologically to play a brass instrument, so it's not going to be a mechanically like assembly line type of thing. Everyone will look a little different. If the sound is good, you probably don't need to worry about it. Uh, a good sound is typically an indication that all things are mechanically working as they should. So just leave it at that, in my opinion. So, oh, I, you know, I forgot one thing, one thing. Let me go back to armature. Nope, evidently I'm going to go forward. So one thing that I learned um, when I was having some chop issues was that uh, this thing called blocked buzzing. So... Um, what you'll do is like have the kid take the mouthpiece, have them buzz some pitch that's comfortable for them. Typically a middle F, middle D is good for kids that are starting out. Have them block the hole completely. You want no air escaping. Let me get kind of close to the camera. Apologies for looking at this mug this early, but you're gonna block the hole pretty early and attempt the buzz. Don't push too hard, just attempt the buzz and the the face that happens is about what your embouchure should feel and look like. So again, mouthpiece, middle register note, block the hole completely. It's a pretty decent indication of what the face should be doing. Um, now you don't want to try to replicate that when you go to the horn, but that's a good place to start. It's a good place to start. And I've, in fact, I learned that from uh, Jeremy Marks, who's a trombone professor over at uh, UNC Charlotte, who learned that when he was recovering from Bell's palsy and couldn't really play at all. So um, an incredibly effective tool to retrain your muscles and your, your big muscle. Okay, so uh, ways to assign to the trombone. Um, of course, if they wanna play the trombone and they're excited about it, try your best to just let them do that. Because um, people that are excited about playing the trombone, pretty few and far between. Uh, I actually, uh, I joined quite late the band. I wanted to play flute, but I joined so late that the only instrument left to rent out was the trombone. So I didn't pick it really. I, I just kind of, you know, that's the last one that there was to play. And a couple of years later, I was like, oh, you know, this isn't too bad. But it was a couple of years later. That aside, if you're if you've got a kid who's willing to just play you know whatever instrument you tell them to 
what you're looking for is, of course, a student that can make a sound on the mouthpiece. You want them to be able to buzz something, uh, something that sounds controlled, you know, maybe a top 40 tune. Maybe they can match your pitch. Maybe they can buzz a nursery rhyme. Just as long as they can make sounds on this guy, it's a great start. You want them to have a good ear. Um, and now you're going to be competing against French horn players for that good ear because that instrument needs, you know, kids with good ears as well. But so is the trombone. Your call is the band director. But you know, if they can match pitches on the mouthpiece, if they can match it by, by voice, uh, if they can get pretty close, trombone's a great option for them because that's one of the instruments that, like, it's necessary that you can hear whether or not you're playing the right pitch. It's, it's, it is super necessary, particularly with the trombone. I'd say French horn would be right, right there with them. Long arms. Um, that may seem like a strange thing to look out for, but obviously the trombone is like a very uh, you know, physical instrument. It's very mobile. So if you have a kid with like, you know, small arms, they're not going to be able to reach out the sixth and seventh at that age. And it might be frustrating for them. In fact, it probably will be because a C, one of the first notes they'll need to know is all the way out in sixth. So it's pretty important that maybe your, your taller kid, your kid who hit his growth spurt early, um, consider putting them on trombone if they match some of the other criteria. Um, otherwise, you know, you'll end up with someone like me who is pretty small and couldn't reach those positions and had to do these like crazy contortions to get the thing out. And then, you know, some of those guys. And then you spend the next couple of years unlearning it, which is fine. Everybody has to unlearn some things, but long arms is definitely a plus. And again, optional. If they want to play the trombone, let them. I, uh, it's pretty rare that I go to a public school that isn't wishing they had more low brass, trombone in particular. So if they're excited about that instrument in particular, and maybe they will, um, it seems like Soul was a pretty influential you know, Disney play, Pixar. Uh, let them do it. Let them do it. <sighs> Let's get into some ideas about pedagogy itself. Sound, sound. So all um, trombone sound, pitch approximator sound comes from four basic elements. That's the air, the chops, the tongue, and the slide. I think, um, or the instrument. So I think this could probably be applied to any brass instrument, but considering that I play the trombone and none of the others, again, I will keep the scope to trombone. Um, but again, uh, this is a firm belief of mine. All sound that comes from the trombone that is musical is some combination of the air, chops, the tongue, and the slide. The proportions of those are all going to change depending on what sounds you're trying to make, but um, those are the four elements that contribute to every sound. So in my opinion, the air is the most important element, uh, and the trombone educators, you should know, the trombone is a lung vacuum. It's a lung vacuum. Uh, you should know this up front. You'll need to remind your trombonists almost daily to use more air. Excuse me. I teach at um, Aubrey Middle School right now, and I, I have yet to have a lesson where I haven't told every single student to use more air. It's, um, it's just an amount that they don't really use. When you breathe, you don't really think about it. Uh, and it's not very often that anybody has to blow with that kind of intensity when they're not playing a brass instrument. So it's a hard thing to kind of relate to. Uh, but just know right up front to get a good sound on the trombone, it's like an uncomfortable amount of air, especially for young students but don't use that term with it. Uh, breath should be conversational. Um, I don't like the idea of tanking up, you know, breathing in, taking, you know, your whole measure to really just Because, <sighs> okay, you know what, actually, everybody do that. Take four, four beats to breathe in as much as you possibly can. So how does your chest feel? How does your neck feel, your shoulders? I don't know about you, but mine feel awful after doing that. It's, um, you know, when I take in as much as I possibly can and hold on to it for a second, so much tension. So for me, what I try to do is I teach a conversational breath. So if, if I'm speaking and I need to take a breath, that's the same kind of breath I'm going to take when I use the trombone. Now, initially, your kids may have to take in a little more than that, because that conversational breath is also a, kind of a conversation and efficiency, right? Um, you can use tons of air and waste half of it, right? Or you can use half the amount of air efficiently and get a good sound. That's the thing that they'll have to toy with on their own in time. But uh, don't teach them to tank up as much as they can because that's going to create tension and you're going to have 
you know, trombones in your band playing. Which is not a sound that anybody wants to hear. You'll have to hear it for a little while, but tension will cause that quicker than just about anything. So the air should always be moving. It's always either coming in or going out. Um, make sure that your kids don't get into the habit of right. It's immediacy of turnaround. The air is always moving, always moving, either in or out, never stagnant. And now, of course, air speed and volume is going to vary depending on your dynamics, the register, the style of the music that you're playing, all of those things. But if you can drive home the idea that it's that it truly is a wind instrument, the air needs to be moving through the instrument at all times. That's the main concept they need to get. The rest of this, they'll figure out for the, you know for themselves in their practice, and that's going to be much more effective than telling them. Well, when you play low, you got to blow slow, and when you play jazz, the airstream has to be this big instead of this big and really fast. That, that doesn't mean anything to them, and it won't for a long time. So if you can teach them either through modeling or through recordings um, or you know, with, with other teachers, if you can bring trombone players in, they can teach this as well. Um, that's going to be a much more effective uh, solution, both in the short term and in the long term. So some ways to teach air. Let me check on the time. I could talk about trombone forever. Well, oh, I should talk about it more quickly. So some ways to teach air. One of my favorites is, um, and I stole this from Dr. Mannix. It's definitely one of her favorites. I do this almost every week. <sighs> she kicks my butt. So air trombone. Um, what you're going to do is play the trombone, just not with your face. Um, you're going to blow air through the horn, articulate the same way you would. And um, what you're listening for is that the air is super continuous and that the tongue isn't stopping the airstream more than it has to. It's not causing any backup. It should, it should never stop the air, always just interrupt. But if I were to say maybe play Mary Had a Little Lamb, point towards the mic, maybe you can hear it. Can we hear the intensity of air, right? So that's what, you're, that's what you wanna hear. You wanna hear that the air is like vigorously moving that the tongue is only interrupting the airstream, not stopping it. There's also the dollar bill trick. Um, I don't carry any cash on me. I'm seeing that that's starting to kind of die out. But if you've got cash on you, it's a great game to play with like middle schoolers. Um, the first couple of like, if I'll teach a master class, you know, as an intro to middle school, I'll bring a dollar bill or a couple. And I'll have the student take the dollar bill, stick it to the wall with both of their hands. And then they have to let go of the bill and at the same time to keep the dollar bill stuck to the wall. So that one can be kind of cool. It's not something you should do right now with COVID and everything, but before COVID, I would you know, bring a couple of them and be like, okay, if you keep it up this amount of seconds, you get to keep the dollar and kids would suddenly freak out like, oh, free money. I mean, I freak out over free money too, but um, that's a great way to teach that kind of intensity of air. And it's great for visual learners too, right? Because then once they've done that a few times and they've got that memorized, instead of saying, send your air into the parking lot or fill up the room, you can say, hey, remember that dollar bill thing? Blow like that, check. Another thing is like uh, the pinwheel. Um, another Dr. Mannix trick that I stole. Let me grab it real quick, so sorry. So this one I use a little less, uh, mainly because I can't figure out how to hold this darn thing, but there's a certain angle you can hold it at and you can do air trombone, but without the slide. So this is a way to further isolate the air away from the instrument. So you can maybe see that it stopped occasionally, which means that my tongue was back in the air up so much that this thing didn't have any more fuel to move. Great indication of a tongue that's too heavy or an airstream that's not persistent enough. Uh, there's the flutter tongue. If your students can roll their R's, you can have them play through their excerpt flutter tongued, and that'll again show you whether or not the air is doing what it needs to do. I was trying to back off on the air to show you what would happen if it didn't, it just went down. But point with that one is the, 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 the growl, the flutter tongue, as long as there's air behind the tongue, it'll keep going. So if the fluttered tongue motion stops, that's an indication that your student is, um, you know, uh, maybe 
not blowing with enough force. I don't like the way that I phrase that, but uh, maybe find gentler terms. Force is not a great word for young ones. Um, and then there's glissandi as a whole. So of course, that's when you move the slide without using the tongue, for the most part. And um, another great exercise to let you, the teacher, know if their air is supporting their chops, if maybe they're um, tending to the slide, which means like they're blowing pretty hard in first, but when it gets out to seventh, they're not blowing quite as hard. It's the opposite of what you need to do, because look at how much more space there is to fill up now. Yeah, nine feet of it. So uh, just a couple of tools that'll let you as a teacher know whether or not your student is using their air correctly. Chops, chops. Again, my, my approach on this is try not to worry about it. You, you need to be aware of it, but um, understanding of the chops comes from reinforcement and practice, not from theoretical, like me wording at you. I can't word understanding of embouchure to you or your students. They have to just do it and learn that way. Um, so high notes don't come from strong or tight chops. This is one of my biggest pet peeves about the brass world. Um, the tighter your chops are, the less they can vibrate. If you're clamping down, the stuff literally just can't move. Um, air speed dictates the range more than like this strong chop idea, right? So if your students are struggling with range, um, drive that home more than anything. Uh, we can have a separate class on like range building. I don't want to take up you know, too much time with that, but because the, the first you know octave of their range will come pretty naturally to them once they understand just what to do here to make notes change. But just know that high notes, it's not a question of strong chops. The pencil trick is great for training corners. You do need firm corners, but as far as clamping down real hard and squeezing and pushing, that's not a high note thing. Um, High register on trombone should be like, pretty easy. Um, I mean, not easy, but like uh, as relaxed as any other register. So sorry for that slick, but the that upper octave, it, it should, it's an air thing. It's an air speed thing. Um, it's not a clamping down thing. So just um, don't give them another reason to chase tension. If they think that is the path to high notes, they want high, fast, and loud, so they're going to do that. Keep them away from tension. Uh, low notes don't come from loosening up either. That's that that actually messed me up for a long time. My low register has always been pretty bad, and it's because I heard someone say, "Well, just loosen up, drop your jaw." So I was like, "Okay, cool, that's what I'll do," and that's what comes out. Of course, not always to that extent, but loose implies that they just let it go. And that's not the case. In fact, uh, in my experience, you need more corner strength for the low register. Um, and I think my bass trombone colleague might tell you the same thing. Um, the corners are so important for the low register because without that, there's no structure. And then these, this meat's just like flapping around, right? There's, there's nothing to hold it in place. So um, that's one of those things that I like to take to the mouthpiece. When we talk about range, there are two main teachers in the trombone. There's the slide itself so just make a good sound and then slowly move the slide and chase that sound when that's when the tone color changes that's where they need to spend the time doing the long tones or maybe more of that more slowly um but low range keep this stuff where it needs to be um so the chops are probably the second most direct influencer of tone quality. I'd say the first is, is the air, just the air. There are plenty of people with fine faces that just don't blow enough or blow too much of a certain way. Um, if they've got a bad sound, it's most likely an air issue, but go ahead and just take a look, make sure, um, make sure that this stuff is all kind of where it needs to be. And um, the instrument in large part will put out what you put in. So there's some people that teach that the instrument is just a big microphone for the mouthpiece. Um, I got mixed feelings about that one, but I do like the, the kind of imagery for the young ones. So um, I'm not, I, if I'm stepping on any toes, um, let, let me know. I know they're like uh, controversial opinions about buzzing, but um, personally, um, I find that at that age, 
buzzing can help them understand that they have to play the pitch here and then match it on the trombone. Um, if I buzz, you know, an E flat and the trombone, which would be in third position, but I keep it in first position. Right, so I can make an E flat come out of the horn if I buzz an E flat into the horn and the sound is awful, terrible. Um, if your students are having a bad sound on that note, it's entirely possible that they're putting the wrong information into the horn. So it can be helpful from time to time to check in and make sure that they are in fact buzzing the right pitch. Um, yeah. yeah. So some ways to teach chops, uh, blocked buzzing, as we've kind of already talked about is pretty important um, for teaching the actual set. For teaching how the embouchure works, um, again, I like to teach through examples and doing instead of like wording at them. So I like to have them buzz sirens, which is just, you know, start on a low pitch, go to a high one and vice versa. Of course, in a uh, range depending on the, uh, on the student, range depending on the student. Um, nursery rhymes, top 40 tunes, anything that'll get them excited about doing it, just you know, have them do that. But as long as they start to understand how to make pitches happen on the mouthpiece, that's gonna teach them what the chops are supposed to be doing, either consciously or subconsciously. To me, it doesn't really matter at that age anyway, uh, as long as they understand how it functions. Sing, buzz, play, I'm a huge advocate of that. Maybe this is uh, my, my jazz training coming through, but uh, I think if they can match the pitch with the ear, and the, the easy, you know, pitch approximator, right? If they can sing the pitch, if they can buzz it on their mouthpiece, uh, fairly likely that they'll be able to pick up the horn and play it. Um, and if not, then that's a separate mechanical issue, likely. Uh, and then the last thing is air attacks. So have, have your students play their notes with no tongue every now and then. Um, ideally, the embouchure should always just be able to respond to air. Um, I find that a lot of young students and myself included at that age use the tongue as a crutch to like jump start, um, jump start, you know, the response here. So if you can take the tongue out of the picture and just have the chops rely on the air once more, that can give you another indication as to whether or not this stuff is working right. So soft and short, this, um, I mean, anything, anything, staccato quarter notes are just, I mean, just fine. I do these in my warm up daily. <laughs> So some issues you might um, find having your students do that is maybe you'll hear the air for a long time before the pitch. And that's fine, that's fine. That means that their aperture is too wide and they're learning you know, where to put it. And that's okay, that's a great way to teach them where it actually goes. So I, I, love, I love using air attacks to help teach face. Because um, that'll again demonstrate what they need to be doing inside the mouthpiece without having them think about it too much. You have them chase the sound, the sound will be a great teacher to them 99% of the time. So the tongue, in my opinion, is the most dangerous element, particularly with the trombone, and the trombone lends itself to falling victim to the tongue's oppression pretty regularly. So keep it out of the way, keep it out of the way, keep it out of the way. With your young trombone players, when they get that slide involved and you tell the first time you tell them to get the gliss and the smear out of there, what they're gonna do, they're gonna anchor that tongue up there when they move the slide. So if their slide speed is slow, the tongue has to hang out there longer to get rid of the gliss. So what you end up with is <laughs> So all this like space in between and the slappy tongue thing. So T, uh, what I like to do, the imagery that works for me and for several of my students is I like to think of the tongue as like a piece of cardboard, right? And it's just a, uh, you know, resting kind of where it is, which should theoretically be behind the teeth, right about on the hard palate. Um, I had always been taught that it was behind the front teeth. Um, I'm actually going through a change right now, trying to move the tongue a little further back and it's a bit of a pain. Um, but about where the gum line is, maybe a little further back on the hard palate. Um, <clears throat> excuse me again. But have the tongue there. It's just resting. It's a piece of cardboard. And when the air starts, it just blows it over. It just blows it over. That's a great way to teach attacks. 
if you have them thinking that you have to go ta, that's what they're going to do. They're going to spit the note out at you. They're going to think that the tongue is what starts the note, which will cause splicks like you just heard, or this really aggressive kind of almost commercial music front, exaggerated commercial music front. So um, if you can get them into this idea that the tongue doesn't really do much, that it just gets knocked out of the way. It's going to give them a much cleaner start to each of their notes. Um, and it's going to help back the air up on them a little less, which again will help them to avoid the tension that's waiting with the tongue. So the, the tongue's job is just to decorate the beginning of each note. It's just that. Um, the tongue doesn't start the sound. Um, the, the tongue only has a small role in the style. And really, in my opinion, a really small role in brass playing in general. The sound doesn't come from the tongue. The sound all comes from the air. So, and again, decorate might be too strong of a term for this. Um, when you start a note, the tongue is set, the air blows it down, that's it. When we talk about articulation, um, I'm just now noticing that I haven't been hitting the bottom of these. Okay, so young trombonists will have two types of articulation the rest of their, those two types are a hard da, which is when you say da, and then there's a light da, which is what you would use for legato, which I don't usually talk to my students about until seventh or eighth grade, because it's kind of a, a bit of a bear to talk about. But um, that one, I don't know that we have an English uh, phonetic for it, but it's, um, uh, for those of you underage, um, plug your ears, but the closest thing is like if you're slurring your speech, da, 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 da. that's the tongue that I would use for legato. Um, it's like a it's like a light brushing or a grazing of that same hard palate. It's not um, yeah. So if you say da, it isn't that. It's so much lighter than that. So the difference, if I were to just play several notes, pretty firm front to the notes and a little bit of space. The soft da 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 da. Barely there. Barely there. Now the function of that one is to simulate a slur. Since you know with the slide, it's trombonists don't really get to pick when they natural slur so much. Um, that's a that's a thing that you'll have to talk to them about eventually, but I wouldn't um, you know, I wouldn't blow their mind with the articulation spectrum until you know seventh or eighth grade maybe. But um, hard da is what you'll want to teach. I, I don't like to teach ta. I think that backs the air up too much and it's too strong of a front for my taste. Um, but, you know, again, find what works for your individual students. The sound is what matters. Uh, we can talk semantics all day. Um, so again, it's be careful with the tongue, but the ways that I like to teach it, um, it the more that they think about this, the worse it'll get. Um, have them again chase sound. Don't have them chase like um, instruction. Don't have them chase instruction. Most kids at that age are not aware enough of their body to for it to mean much to them anyway. So um, I like to, again, teach in sound at that age. So hard da or soft da, um, I don't teach ta. I'm not telling you that it's wrong. Um, there are plenty of great band directors, mine included, that do teach ta. Um, I just, I find that I had to unlearn that. And it took several years and I'm still working on it. So um, for me, a hard da does just fine. Um, and then we can introduce them to the spectrum of you know, articulation, hardness, and softness later. But the hard da is a good middle of the road for me. Um, so the tongue is a cobra striking at its prey. The strike happens when the slide moves. So we talked about the four elements of trombone. Talked about the four elements of trombone and really all trombone sound is you know it stems from these four things in the way that they're coordinated with each other with this one um the coordination happens between the tongue and the slide so if i were to you know s simulate playing a scale da 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 the tongue strike and the slide movement should happen at the same time and the quicker the slide movement is the more clean that that transition between notes will be because the tongue has less garbage to filter out. So again, the tongue should strike on the hard palate, just find the teeth, not 
between the teeth, not between the teeth. Uh, and again, air is what starts the sound. The air is what starts the sound. The tongue just cleans it up. It puts a nice button on it, makes it presentable. But the tongue doesn't start the sound. You could start a beautiful tone without the tongue. The tone or the tongue again is just there to decorate. So the slide. Um, it's the easiest thing to teach, and it's the hardest to master. Uh, I'm not convinced that anybody has. Maybe well, maybe Joe Alessi has. It's pretty close. But slide has to be well maintained. I mean, and I mean the slide itself has to be well maintained. So. Um, it, this thing is so delicate. It's just, it's so delicate. The tiniest little ding can make it just literally unplayable. So um, if you've got a clumsy kid, um, maybe, maybe not trombone, unless they fit all the other criteria, and then maybe this is just that life lesson for them. But um, it, it needs to be lubricated regularly at least once a week. Um, if you hear scratching, send the horn to the shop. I know that, you know, uh, school budgets can be tight. That's not where you want to cut corners. Um, uh, a, a bad slide where they're having to muscle it to where it needs to be is going to be frustrating for them to play. They're not going to practice. They're not going to want to because it's not fun. I don't like playing on a bad slide even now. Um, and it's going to make every element of their playing worse. It's, it's going to affect their intonation because they can't make micro adjustments. It's going to affect their legato because the slide movement becomes jerky and tense. It's going to affect their sound because of all the tension. So lubrication, make sure it's lubricated. Make sure that it's not stored. Um, you know, on a chair, on the floor, uh, make sure that everything is just taken care of. You want a three finger grip. I like to teach either um, the, the, the Italian thing, you know, it's a spicy meatball, or the, the teacup grip, one of the two. Either way, you want, you want two fingers and the thumb. You want that on the, the brace and you want your wrist to do the work. So as a rule of thumb, and this is something I like to chase for a long time with the younger students, They've got to get from one to four in the same amount of speed that a valve instrument has to go from here to here. Um, so that tends to be a pretty effective illustration for them. They're like, holy cow, how am I going to do that? I'm like, I don't know, try hard. And then they usually you know, try hard and do it. So really quick slide motion, pretty imperative. Hard thing to teach. Uh, it's one of those habits that you either start them with and they get it or you yell it at them every day in middle school um, because they were never told it. Uh, and that's, that's fine. Trombone's like one of those weird, like idiosyncratic instruments. That there's just a lot of strange things about it. But quick slide, quick slide. That's one of those things you want to probably try to drive home. The downside to that is that it can contribute to some tension. Um, this is the one time I think that that trade off might be worth it. Um, it's pretty hard to learn to move your slide quickly once you've done it slow for so long. I remember when I finally heard it for the first time in um, a freshman year of high school and I started taking lessons with Don Huff. Um, that was all I heard after we spent two months on nothing but long tones. It was nothing but quick slide. Boy, move that slide. That's all I heard for months and months and months. Um, so start introducing them to that idea. It's pretty important. Let's see, let's see, let's see. So again, ways to teach the slide. The main thing you have to teach with the slide is coordination, and that's a battle that they will fight for their whole musical lives. But the air trombone that we talked about before, incredibly effective teacher for that. Um, you can actually hear if the tongue itself is doing the thing it's supposed to do when the slide moves. So let's turn towards the mic again just to be safe. It's chords. So You might be able to see that, I can't tell, but moving at about the same time. Not moving at the same time. So the difference with those would be in sound. Coordinated. Here's uncoordinated. You hear all that garbage in between the notes. Doesn't sound like a valved instrument at all. And sound wise, the goal at that stage should be for them to sound like a valve instrument. So everything should happen at about the same time. Positions in the scope of trombone as a whole are relative. For the scope of public education, make them absolute at first. You can talk about adjusting for the partials later in their development, maybe in high school, um, maybe even in middle school if you've got a really good middle school program. 
but for your your beginners and a, maybe a year or so after, positions should just be absolute. No, as the band director, as the all-knowing, omnipotent band director, that they're relative, but at, teach absolute at first. Make sure. Oh, this is a huge one. I have to preach about this all the time uh, to my students here. Even uh, make sure that your students put your their their slide in the same place every time. So if they've got a position that's one two one two one. One is an easy one to put in the same place because it's all the way in, but make sure two is in the same place every time. Otherwise, you're giving me three different A440s, and I don't know which one of those I should be listening for, right? So, reasonably consistent, but I've heard some students go as far as and call all of those second position, right? But the, I heard like four different pitches. Make sure that this, the trombone does go, that the trombone slide does go where it needs to go every time, every time. You can use your ear for that, you can use your eyes for that, but make sure that second position is second position, third position is third position. Everybody knows where they're supposed to be and they're putting them there every time. And that's an easy one for you to diagnose as a band director. You can hear it, you can see it. So call them out on that as soon as you can. Um, you gotta be kind of hard on them. So, let me go back. There we go. So there's this thing called the Burt. I don't own one, but what it is is it's this little plastic eye that you put right here, you know, just on the lead pipe, and you can take your mouthpiece off, stick it in there, and then buzz and move the slide at the same time. It's a really great invention. I'm really glad that that's a thing. Um, incredibly effective. It teaches them to coordinate the buzz in the slide. So they can buzz through their band music while moving the slide at the same time. And then you can hear if they're actually putting the right information into the horn. You can see if the slide's going where it needs to go. You can hear if they're putting the right information into the horn. And you can see if they're moving together. Really incredible um, tool for, for you as teachers and for them as their own teachers as they start to understand how all these things work together. Um, seventh position hack. So I've got one thing to show you for your small babies. So for your kids that have a hard time reaching seventh position, let me see if I can't maybe get far enough away. So um, if your kids have a hard time reaching seventh position, what you can do is have them walk up to the horn, you know, regular posture. Let me see if I can remember which, okay. Turn the lower half of their body, so that's from the waist down, 90 degrees to the left. Keep the up half, you know, the upper half exactly where I was before. Um, and you'll find suddenly they could reach seventh position. So what that does, and you can do it in a chair as well. So if I sat straight like this, I can't reach it. If I rotate the bottom half, suddenly I can. Um, that lets your shoulder get involved. That little tiny rotation allows your shoulder to be a part of that like slide moving process. And it gives you another like, you know, I don't know how much that is, but it gives me another like two to three inches of like, you know, wingspan. So for your young ones, that's a great tool to get them out to seventh. Just be careful that they don't start contorting themselves into like all these weird shapes. Um, that's one thing that can happen. A lot of times what they'll do is instead rotate the top half of their body so they're playing out of the side of their face and they've got seventh position but no sounds coming out because their mouthpiece is over here. So be careful about you know, making sure that these you know, small babies who are still you know, learning how to be a human um, are moving the right parts of their bodies. So. Uh, the last thing for teaching the slide is metered slide rhythm. Move it in time. That's something that I think some people just don't really think about, but um, move the slide in time. If the rhythm is da, 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 ba, 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 you should see the rhythm that we're playing in the movement of their slides for the most part if all those notes change. But slides should move in time. It should be just another element of the music making process. Yeah, it's how we play the instrument, but you can make this a physical, like, timekeeping mechanism as well. Okay, so teaching sound. Sound is super important, obviously. Um, my soapbox is that fifth graders, sixth graders don't know what a trombone is supposed to sound like. Um, trombone isn't like a pop culture thing. Like they haven't, they li it's likely they haven't been exposed to it. Um, trumpet still has a pretty firm place in pop culture. So, so does saxophone, so do drums, and then of course piano, guitar, bass. Trombone, not so much. Oboe, not so much. Um, this, this goes to all of them. Make sure your kids know what the instrument's supposed to sound like. 
Um, if all they do is blow air and wiggle, the slide sounds will come out, but we don't know if they're the right ones and they don't either. So make sure they do know. Um, I've uh, so many students that I'm teaching right now, I'm like, so like, uh, what's a trombone supposed to sound like? Or like, who's your favorite trombone player? Are you happy with the sound? The, every time, every time. So I've started with, with my private students every week. They've got one new YouTube video to listen to, and we'll talk about it for five, 10 minutes before we start playing anything. And lo and behold, if the long tones I've asked them to do don't suddenly mean something to them, right? They've got now a goal. They've got a reason to be doing these long tones. When they pick up the horn, they've got something up here to chase. That's unbelievably helpful in developing a sound concept and a good tone. Make sure they listen. Get them listening. Um, now, tone can take a really long time to develop with some kids. Some of them pick it up and have a good sound in two weeks. Some of them study for three, four years before they figure the tone thing out. I was the second one. It took me a long time to get a good sound. Um, so be patient. Um, they will notice that you're being patient, and that really, really, really does matter. It matters at all ages, but especially at that young age where they're so impressionable. If you get frustrated, they're going to get frustrated. They're going to quit. If you're patient, they'll be like, oh, well, if he's not expecting it to happen this fast, then I guess it just takes a long time. Um, that's been my experience. And tone, first and foremost, it doesn't matter what you can play on the horn. If you play it with a bad sound, people don't want to listen to it. So make sure that the first thing that these students are chasing is the tone. They have to have a good sound first and foremost. Quick breather here. There's there's more stuff. There's more stuff. Um, incredible. Does anybody have any questions about anything before we move on? How long have you been teaching? What's that? How long have you been teaching? Uh, since 2011. 2011. I, um, I, I did the Allstate thing, and then some local band directors were like, hey, will you come to our school and like teach our kids? And I was like, yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> Yeah, and that's that's kind of how that got started. And then I, you know, um, found out I like doing that more than playing the trombone. I love them both, but um, the teaching thing is like, you know, why I get out of bed. I don't get out of bed to do long things. <laughs> hey, Tyler, um, <clears throat> we've got about five more minutes. And um, just so you know, uh, th these students are all performance majors, not future band directors. Um, however, uh, I have had request if you would be willing to share your PDF or your PowerPoint because uh, they they have loved your presentation today. Oh, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, as soon as um, if you can give me one more heads up, like, hey, time is up. I'll stop the share. I'll post it in the chat. Um, in fact, I'll send it to your email after this is done so you can hit it. Perfect. Great. So we've got five minutes. I need to be pretty uh, quick about what I choose to talk about. So. Off we go. Um, as a teacher, in order to correct problems in your students playing, you've got to understand what each of the four elements of trombone contribute to this like RL product that we call tone. So again, all problems on the trombone come from either a lack of coordination of those four elements, or just that one of those elements has gone haywire, like the fourth wheel on a shopping cart at Food City. So. Anytime there's an issue sound wise, hit, hit back to those four fundamentals, those four elements, and decide which one of those would cause this problem. If it's an articulation problem, most likely the tongue, no, excuse me, most likely the air, could also be the tongue, fairly likely. Less commonly a chop issue, but if they have weak corners, that can affect the articulation because the sound, or sorry, the air deflects out this way. And um, doesn't create a proper seal where the tongue makes contact with the gums. Um, that's information for you, not for young children. Um, sound issues, almost always air. Occasionally it can be chops. Uh, and sometimes it can be the instrument, say a leaky, you know, um, leaky water key, or there's a hole, or there's a dent somewhere really important. Um, but typically it's an air issue. Most of the time, young students are going to, you know, they're going to sigh instead of blow. And then note connection, that's a mixed bag. That can be a lot of things, but if, um, and it also depends on what about the note connection you don't like. But most of the time, it's a slow slide, and that's when you've got that glissy thing, that smeary garbage sound that we you know, demonstrated before. 
uh, if you've got a choppy sound, sound with a lot of space, the notes aren't connected at all, that means your tongue is doing that thing we talked about where it hangs out in the roof of your mouth to separate all that glissando. And if there is no sound or no connection, that's an air issue. It's an air issue. They're probably blowing at each individual note instead of through the phrase, yeah? Legato. This is another hour and a half class. We can't, we can't cover this in four minutes. We can't really cover it in 90. But legato, huge topic in teaching the trombone. Huge, huge, huge. Um, if you're interested in that, shoot me an email. Or we'll go get coffee, and I'll talk to you about legato until you're tired of hearing about it. Um, range, don't glamorize range for your babies. Just do not. Um, I know everybody wants to play high, fast, loud, and it's super cool to show our kids Maynard Ferguson and get them interested in jazz. Um, it's also a great way to get them to hurt themselves. Um, I, my range was uh, pretty decent. Um, was uh, I, I, I learned that note in eighth grade and kept it around ever since. Um, but I played it every chance that I got and uh, gave myself a nice little hernia from playing it improperly and pushing too hard. I kept that hernia. I got it in, when I was 13. I kept it until I was 24. Um, and it disqualified me from a principal Air Force job in California before I got it fixed. Um, so don't glamorize range. Don't hurt your kids. Uh, intonation. Oh, what does that have to, why would I put that there? Let's talk about it anyway. Intonation. Put kids with good ears again on French horn and trombone. Um, obviously, you, in a perfect world, they'd be on every instrument, but we live in this one, which is, as we have seen for the last several years, not perfect. So. Um, have your kids sing regularly. Make sure that we're training their ears. That's a really easy thing to do. Don't call it ear training. Just have them sing, and their ears are going to get better, and they won't even know it. It's sneaky. Uh, but again, good ear, French horn or trombone, good ear and long arms, trombone, hard yes. The ways to teach tone, listening, 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 listening. Of course, long tones are helpful, um, and there are about a billion exercises that we can do for those. But the most important thing you can do uh, for, I mean, yourselves, as you already know, and of course your young students, is just listen. Develop a sound concept. I'm embarrassed to say this, but I forget the name of the great brass pedagogue that said you should be playing a one, two, or two tubas at all time. I guess it might have been Jacob. Um, it's like the one in your head and the one in your hand, right? You, your kids should be the same way. They got to envision this, this instrument while they're playing this one as well. Um, so good sound comes from an optimal balance of airspeed and volume against the, the chop. How do you know when it's optimal? When the sound's good. It's about that simple. It's about that simple. The frustrating part of this growth is because you can't really teach this. You can give information that'll guide them towards it, but not to it. They have to do enough experimentation on their own to figure out what that balance feels like, and then they'll be able to replicate that. Listening to pros, of course, will help quite a bit. So again, this is a one hour crash course on something that would take at least a semester to cover, likely longer. So uh, I know that I've missed stuff. There's no way I covered everything I need to. So if you've got questions or if you come up on a situation that you don't have an answer to, yell at me, shoot me an email. Um, uh, when you shoot me an email, I'll give you my phone number so you can get to me quicker. I want to help. I want to be a resource for you. So anything, literally just shoot me an email. There's my address. It's also on my website. So the, the best way to learn how to teach the trombone is to learn trombone yourself. Um, it's really a bit of a bear to learn, but you should do it for the sake of any of your students. So take trombone lessons if you can uh, from your friendly, I do use this term loosely, neighborhood trombonists. There are over 70 of them here and all the ones I've met are just great people. They want to help. So um, right now there's a, um, there's a student here who's doing her student teaching and she, she's taking lessons with me. Um, just so she can teach her kids better. And because she's doing it for her kids, I'm not charging her. Like, are you kidding me? Like, she comes by like twice a month for uh, you know an hour and a half, two hours. Um, and I bet she's gonna be an incredible band director. I thought that before she started taking trombone lessons, but now one of the harder instruments to teach, she's gonna come in really, really well equipped, I hope, to teach her kids. So um, if you wanna teach trombone, this is the best way to learn how to do that. So. Uh, that's all I've got for you, and it's a good thing because I've kept you over two minutes.